Hello, and welcome to Everything is Happening. This event is part of the inaugural Sussex Festival of Ideas, a dynamic and engaging programme of talks, events and activities. The festival is produced by the newly formed School of Media, Arts and Humanities at Sussex University. This event is being recorded and will be posted to the Sussex Festival of Ideas website after the festival. Live captioning is available and can be activated by pressing the live transcript button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, if you wish. A member of the festival's team might contact webinar attendees for their feedback after the event. If you do not wish to be contacted, please email the festival's producer or a member of the festival team to opt out of these communications. You can find the contacts on the festival website. At this point, it is my pleasure to hand over to Gemma, Gemma Deer, who will introduce our wonderful panel. Yeah, thank you, Margareta. Um, and yes, yeah, thank you to the festival organisers for making this event possible. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, so, yeah, my name is Gemma Rowan Deer, and it is my pleasure to return virtually to Sussex, where I did my PhD from my current home in Munich, Germany. And it is also my honour today to introduce two singular and inspiring thinkers and to discuss their collaborative writing project that has been focused on what has been happening in and to the world since the start of the pandemic. So Nicholas Royal is Professor of English at the University of Sussex. He has written numerous books in literary studies and deconstruction, including the indispensable introduction to literary to literature, criticism and theory, co-authored with Andrew Bennett and now in its fifth edition, as well as Telepathy and Literature, After Derrida, The Uncanny, How to Read Shakespeare, and most recently, Ellen Sisu, Dreamer, Realist, Analyst, Writing. He has also written a memoir and two novels, Quilt and An English Guide to Birdwatching. Timothy Morton is Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University. They have written on diverse topics, including philosophy, ecology, literature, music and art. And their many books include Ecology Without Nature, The Ecological Thought, Realist Magic, Hyper Objects and Dark Ecology. Most recently, they have co-authored with Dominic Boyer a book called Hypo Subjects on Becoming Human, and they have two books forthcoming later this summer, All Art is Ecological and Spacecraft. Morton's influence has also extended far beyond academia, and they have collaborated with many visual and musical artists as well. In 2017, The Guardian newspaper called them, quote, the philosopher prophet of the Anthropocene. So welcome, Tim and Nick, and thank you both so much for being here and sharing this work with us today. Um, so we're here to talk about this collaborative writing project that the two of you have been working on during the pandemic um, under the title Everything is Happening. Um, so to start us off, I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit more about what exactly this project is and how it came about. Yeah. Um, who wants to go first, Tim? Oh, to the, the hardest question first is, what is, what is this? What is this thing that we did, Nick? Yeah. Or that we're still doing, actually? What is this thing that we're all still doing? We don't know. And a, 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 few, um, a few months ago, people were asking me a lot of like um, about hyper objects again, this book that I wrote. And I said, well, nowadays, I don't think I would write that book and maybe if I even if I did I wouldn't write it the same way and one big reason is we've all and when I say we I, I'm sort of saying anyone with a with with a pulse who's, who's a human being on the planet have got the hyper object emotion now it's called coronavirus and the feeling is more important than the word insofar as in a funny way feelings are from the future because feelings are sort of like ideas that you don't know what they are yet you know that's why do you do therapy because you're having a feeling you don't know what it is you don't know how to how to deal with it and so sort of the idea is really just the, the the past in a way it's just like like the receipt that comes out of the cash register of the sort of thinking 
process. So I don't, I don't even know if I'd write that book anymore because we know what it is, and it's more important than a than a than a word, you know. Um, and this thing that's we we we're going through is sort of it's everywhere and it's nowhere. My mum is a social worker, and um, she used to say, you know, if if you can see two instances of of, of abuse in a family, then it's sort of everywhere. So by the time there were two cases of coronavirus on the west coast of the USA, I assumed it was on every surface of the USA. Yeah. So it's sort of weird because it's sort of everywhere and nowhere. You can't quite point to it, but it's affecting affecting everything. Yeah, and we're we're um, we're writing about that, and I suppose. Um, we don't know what it is that we are writing, and I, I suppose that's one of the things that has um, been exciting about the prospect of, of talking here today, but also terrifying because we really don't know what it is that we're doing, and um, we don't know what it what it becomes if it becomes something. Yeah, you know? it's true. I'm, I'm scared, Nick, a little bit. Um, so perhaps the the best thing to do is just to to hear some of the text at this point, and uh, people can make their own minds up as to what they think it is that you're doing. Yes, um, I mean we, we did prepare uh, for short extracts, and I suppose it's worth saying in advance that these extracts are quite haphazard. I mean there are connections between them, and and one of the um, in, in some ways, I think, uh, exciting, uh, strange things about the project is the ways in which um, different parts of it connect. But these are fairly randomly chosen and they start, well, randomly in, in some ways, they start with the first entry, which um, was written on the 1st of April, 2020. Uh, and they go up to uh, I think um, this April, uh, but if if people can can bear in mind the the fact that there isn't in a sense any uh, obvious linear flow um, here, I'll I'll, uh, I'll start us off. First April, twenty twenty, the world transformed. In mid January, I flew from Gatwick to Barcelona with my wife Janan and young sons William and Augustus. It was a belated birthday present from her, a precious opportunity to meet up with my older children, Sebastian, Alexi and Eleanor. Sebastian lives in London, Alexi and Eleanor in Helsinki. It was marvellous to be all of us together. We had two apartments for the weekend. The weather was sunny and beautiful. We spent much of Saturday wandering around the museums, especially the Miro Foundation on the Great Green Hill through quiet little parks with charming fountains and streams. On Sunday night, Sebastian, William and I went to watch Lionel Messi score the only goal in a dull but still compelling game against Granada. Impressive in a different way was the phenomenon of 65,441 people, plus us, vacating the New Camp Stadium in what seemed about five minutes flat. We'd climbed many stairs to find our elevated seats and witness the wizardry of Messi. But these staircases were now closed off to enable massed, mass, rapid mass exodus down concrete slopes. There was none of the jostling and bottlenecks of English football crowds. That same night, Janan and Augustus took a plane back to England. She threw up violently on getting home and was unwell for several days. In the following fortnight, she experienced excruciating pain in her sinuses and eventually got antibiotics. She also lost her sense of smell William developed a dry cough that kept him awake at night. Augustus was poorly with a runny nose and fever. I had a dry cough for one night and was phlegmy for weeks. It was only a couple of weeks ago that Janan read an account of coronavirus symptoms tallying with her post-Barcelona illness. Did we all have it? We still do not know. The UK government promises that cheap tests are going to be available from chemists and from Amazon in the next week or two. Would this be a good moment for me to read my 
first extract, Nick? Sure. I think, yeah, just just if you just carry on and, and read through all sure. of what you had prepared um, so sure. people can get a sense of, if not the flow, some Absolutely. different parts of the text. Will do. Okay, here we go. 13th July, 2020. Lizards are, let's face it, tadpoles. Tadpoles who somehow survived when their puddle dried out. All the spines and ferocious appearances are a total bluff. They couldn't be weaker. All of them also have the weak chameleon-like power of taking on the coloration of the surfaces on which they find themselves, as if they were permanently under the influence of other things. It was this passive habit that kept Nikki, my lizard, safe from my cat, Oliver, who showed up one year later. Oliver would wonder whether there was something in the tank. Nicodemus would deter him through the interesting tactic of doing nothing whatsoever. Cats see in a red-green spectrum. When Nikki is calm, her colors are mottled and variegated in that spectrum. To Oliver, it must have been as if there was a strange looking rock in there. Is that rock alive or not? You could see his eyes crossing. He would keel over fast asleep. My lizard had hypnotized my cat by doing nothing at all. I started thinking about lizards. We're so mammal-centric, we humans. We talk of reptiles ruling the earth, but that's just because we have a thing about kings and emperors. I'm the lizard king, I can do anything, Jim Morrison. Mammals are like, like, mammals like lions are like other feudal lords. Primates are the capitalist creatures. This has nothing to do with evolution. This weak, sad, isolated part of me was reflected in poor Nikki, a non-binary bearded dragon who, as I write this, is with any luck being put out of her misery in hospital. She went to the exotic pet part of a strangely enormous hospital for pets in Houston last week, two days after she started keeling over for no reason and landing upside down. Lizards have trouble breathing upside down. She had blood work and was x-rayed, nothing. Then a neurologist saw her. Yes, there are lizard neurologists. The neurologist was concerned. Nikki couldn't move and was unresponsive though awake. Clearly she had brain damage. Bearded dragons can have strokes. Who knew? Thank you for teaching me how to care for myself, Nikki. Thank you for showing me that there are time scales that mammals only dream of. Perhaps esoteric religious traditions around the world lionize reptiles for a reason, this one reason alone, perhaps. Perhaps meditating isn't about rising above the human, but about a mammal way of rediscovering your inner lizard. The mammal genome is all about running away from predators and seeking prey or food in general, which is a good definition of Buddhist samsara, the search for pleasure and the shunning of pain. Lizards, on the other hand, just sit there. They're solar panels, which is why they have to be on top. It's not from some reptile brain aggression. It's because they're going to die if they're not near to sunlight. They're on solar system temporality, not a hunter and hunted one. My ex-wife once stroked the mites in Nikki's eyes with a cotton bud. One year later, she came through the door of my house Nikki stood straight up, her hands resting on the glass of the tank. I think that for Nikki, just five minutes had passed since Kate removed the mites around her eyes. A year of mammal time, five minutes of lizard time. Esoteric meditation instruction sure does read like encouragement for lizards. The sun is always shining. Don't worry, the clouds are temporary. Just sit and soon the clouds will part. Here comes the sun and I say it's all right. But none of this explains what it was like having COVID-19 in Colorado two weeks ago. 31st of March, 2021. My friend Natalia Gasson, who did the wonderful illustrations to an English guide to bird watching, says, I don't need to look for it. The uncanny follows me about. But then that's what's uncanny, isn't it? You may think you're following it, like following the ghost in Henry James' The Jolly Corner or the ghost in Jack Derrida's Spectres of Marx, but it's following you. Words fall into disuse, are abandoned or stop working like brickworks and opera houses and thermostats. Until this week, I felt quite attached to the possibilities of the neologism telemechanics. When I wrote about the marine iguanas off the Galapagos Islands, holding their breaths underwater and moving through the lethal cold waters like victims of a home invasion, 
I was thinking of George Harrison and how I would listen with my mother to his songs. And then you wrote about George Harrison as if we were already in the same book, which we were. I thought of telemechanics as a thing of beauty, ambiguity and irony, happenings at a distance, the effects of unseen operations in the evocations of writing. But then I discovered the word teleperformance. Do you know it? Teleperformance is a company, you know, the kind of creepy company that no one ever hears about, which employs 380,000 people in 34 countries. And it's proposing to install webcams to watch staff and ensure that employees minimize time spent away from their desks, stretching their legs, taking a pee, checking their phones, or who's to say, reading a book. It's all about introducing measures to stop you from hampering your productivity. Teleperformance, what an abject actual and verbal exploitation. I think of retracting the term telemechanics and replacing it with the teleperformative in an attempt to bring at least some possible other meaning and desire, some restitutive dignity to a word that might be read and experienced so differently. A ghostly restitution, because teleperformative wasn't a word until now. Shakespeare is struck by this, the context in which you can't swallow your words or retract things. Had I it written, I would tear the word. Romeo knows he can't not be Romeo. The name is his unwanted mortgage, his death deal. You know all about this as a guy who has a lifelong mort battle on. And while there are things you can tear up, like a legal document before it's signed and sealed, you can't take back what you've said. That's the real euphoria of Hamlet's riposte to Claudius. How fares our cousin Hamlet? Excellent, i faith, of the chameleon's dish. I eat the air, promise crammed. You cannot feed capons so. I have nothing with this answer, Hamlet. These words are not mine. No, nor mine now. Future feel is the sense of the air, promise crammed, of being able to call out the king. It's the excitement of this moment at which a criminal leader, supply name as appropriate, can be pulled down by some power of counter theatre the plays the thing. And every word is an ecstasy, not mine. Every word is just flowing or crashing or flying out and there's no going back. Everything is happening right now. April the 18th, 2021. Time, guilt, stress, stress, stress. But look, a thing about chameleons eating the air, the air of what I've been calling the structure of feeling. The can you feel it that is the primordial energy of language, not the words, the energy, not the receipts, the ocean. I'm late to the party, but I'm holding. What am I holding? Everything happening, that's what I've been holding. The everything is happeningness. What happened? Dazed, traumatized, forgetful as a protective measure, I struggle to recall. Oh yeah, Simon was depressed, is depressed, and this 12 year old son of mine was able to tell me that he had suicidal thoughts. Great, there was a warm enough ocean of parenting and siblinghood. Claire was in on my triage to let him say that. His mum says there's nothing wrong with him. He's making it up. Hamlet, oh, he's just pretending to catch the conscience of the king. Why the fuck would you be depressed if your dad had been murdered? Asked Tim sarcastically. What happened? Old mole isn't working in the memory ground very fast today. I do have molehills in my garden now. Now that it's not a lawn, but a long, the old English for lawn. A pian to biodiversity, that's what, where leaf blowers roam no more. And those leaf blowers that look like bumper cars, only they definitely aren't electric. But, oh right, Claire's heart. I've never seen anything as beautiful as the uh, echocardiogram. 
It was like watching an opal turning in your fingers. It was alive, even more amazing than seeing the fetus Claire in her mum's uterus, seeing Claire's heart, life, not bios or Zoe or whatever the philosophy people like to talk about, but thumos, which I take to be what the old school literature people called life, the Levis people, and in a way also the Sisu people. For me, theory feel is actually life without the vitalist white patriarchal buzzing sound it used to make. That was always way too regular. Rhythm, it means your heart really, ri as in rain to flow, thum as in thumos, the thing you point to in your chest when you're ancient Greek and you say thumos. From a distance, it's going badum, badum, badum. Basically, it's in an iambic or trochaic rhythm. At the start of Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon, it's doing the trochaic dumba, dumba. But as you get closer, tune in with that seeing as a form of hearing called an ultrasound, slowly moving along with the heart, sending pulses to it, receiving back echoes. As you get closer, you see and hear how it's always fibrillating, lovely word. It's trembling. What D.H. Lawrence said about novels, what octopi look like when they're dreaming. They look like this sound, rippling with colors, a sound like power and light. Wow, Coleridge, yes, correct. That's the Aeolian harp. What if everything was? He corrects himself via his chastening partner, but the cat's out of the bag. The octopus has jumped out of its tank and the image is implanted. What if all life forms, the leaves, the hills made of seashells, what if all of it were harps? What if, what if, what if, what if, that iambic rhythm, promise crowned? Thank you very much for those readings. Um, so before I get into my questions proper, just so that um, the audience can get a bit more of a sense of the the scale or scope of of this project. Can you just say, um, obviously, you started it in in April 2020, and you said it's ongoing. But how often have you been exchanging these pieces of writing? Um, how how big is this thing that you don't know what it is? I always feel a little bit late with my uh, contributions, but Nick and I send each other things across what has often been called the big pond um, for uh, pretty much every every week or so, possibly every two weeks. Um, and um, we'll write an entry or two for um, one or two or three days, and then we'll send it back. And um, for some very strange reason, every email subject heading has had to do with Wimbledon tennis so far. So we're sort of it's not a falling out at tennis like in Hamlet, but it, there's definitely a lot of falling going on when we do it. Yeah, I think I, I think the latest word count is somewhere around 160,000. So, you know, it's way too long to be a book, in fact. Um, I don't know whether there's any possibility of getting a publisher interested in more than one volume. That sounds a bit... Um, bit far-fetched really doesn't it um, yeah it does um nevertheless it's it's so it's not just compelling to write it it's it's very it's like it's sort of healing for me to write it if i could use a word like that it's actually um on a number of different levels i'm a big huge fan of free association i've, I've been in psychoanalysis since 1997 with the same guy who's retiring in july which must mean that i must like him enough to spend six figure dollar sums on him um, or something. Um, and, and, and I'm a huge big free association fan. And one thing that I love about any kind of deconstructive type approach to, to writing or thinking is that it's very free associative. And I find that free association is very lubricating. And there's a lot of stuff in me to, to, that, that needs to be lubricated and sort of loosened and flow, you know. Um, and so I'm, I, I personally have found this very, very, um, therapeutic and it's actually helped me to think about maybe I could stop just writing things where I'm kind of like acting being right aka being a scholar 
and, and actually start writing things that one might call fiction or, or non-fiction or creative non-fiction or whatever, whatever the right phrase is for those things, you know. Um, so I actually have a strong kind of feeling of I don't want it to stop even though, you know, this is not the ideal, you know, thing in terms of like making a product for someone to, to put in a shop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense also is that it's been, um, it's been surprising. It's, it hasn't stopped being surprising. And um, for me, you know, there's so much, uh, there's so much kind of weight and, and baggage around the word deconstruction and, and so many people um, feel squeamish at the very word. But, you know, if, if it means anything, in a sense, it, it means surprise for me. You know, it's about being surprised. And um, so th th this continues to, to be an extremely stimulating thing to be doing, whatever it is that we're doing. It, it kind of spins into other things that I'm working on and and I don't know Tim if if this is a, a shared uh, experience but I was recently for example writing a, a little paper very very short paper I couldn't get it short enough um, it was called magical shrinking mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I found myself thinking about as I maybe haven't in, in such a focused way before. And it was, you know, in, in significant part because of this project that we've been working on, that for Freud, who of course was never analyzed, uh, writing was itself uh, part of his analysis. It was uh, what he was, it was his way in part of, of um, uh, discovering and performing and um yeah a kind of logic of of um healing perhaps uh of um, um surprising himself as well i i think and you know i think you know it's been i've i've enjoyed working on this project immensely and i i too feel sort of strangely attached to it. I'm not sure what it would be like to stop doing it. Um, but it's it certainly in other ways been um, in keeping with my experience of collaborative projects in the sense that, you know, I've done, I've written three books with my friend, Andrew Bennett at the University of Bristol. And um, we've had you know, very different experiences with each of those books, but, uh, in every case, and, and as, as continues to be the case, because we're currently sort of looking at the prospect of, of doing a sixth edition of the introduction, for example, there is enormous uh, pleasure in collaboration, in somehow um, it not being yourself, right? It's one of the ways in which one can stop being oneself or, or, or um, give up uh, lose, um, free up, and, and maybe, you know, that free association idea that you mentioned, I think, is is part of that for me. Yeah, the, um, just to say that the, um, in a way, it's like, w whenever I write a sentence anyway, I feel like I'm reading it, you know, um, and so it's just kind of being more explicit about something that's already, that's already happening, um, which is that you're kind of writing a thing for future you, you know, um, or, or maybe future you is writing a thing for you right now. Sometimes I, re I read my stuff like it's self-help from future Tim. Luckily, nobody else reads it this way. Um, but, the, but the idea of making it just very explicit and honest and let's actually do a thing together. And I've only ever done music together with people. I've never written things with people, not very much anyway, Nick. And um, I'm very grateful to you for wanting to 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 do this with me, actually, because it's it's been a tra tra magically transformational thing for me. So to um to kind of pick up on this notion of um the writing bit coming from or perhaps being for a future in which the pandemic will have been a memory, um, I want to ask a little bit more about. 
temporality. So Nick, your your first entry that you read descri describes this kind of transformation of the past. Um, so the illness that you and your family had is later understood to have possibly been COVID. Um, and then in a later entry, you write this wonderful line, future feel is the sense of the air, promise crammed. Um, and Tim, you write of your lizard showing you that there are timescales that mammals only dream of. Um, and meanwhile, these are, of course, all dated pieces of writing. They all have this kind of timestamp from which they originated. So I wondered if you can just each of you reflect a little bit more on the experience of time um, in the pandemic and how it manifests in this writing. Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, perhaps it is the subject of the writing. Um, I think Tim uh, introduces the phrase virus time quite early on. And um, of course, virus time is not homogeneous. It's not uh, this kind of um, thing that doesn't alter. And part of the... Um, challenge of of carrying on with the writing is trying to respond to the ways in which uh, the sense of virus time changes whether we like it or not so um i think there's there's quite a bit in the some of the earlier months of of the writing where we are thinking about you know what it what it was doing. You know, last um, spring and early summer, what what was happening to us as humans in terms of the experience of time and the way in which, uh, in in some respects, everything was taking on a a kind of slowness, uh, a kind of dream uh, quality. You know that sense of um, the unconscious as you know a, a kind of timelessness uh, that was one of the things that uh, I think for both of us the uh, the coming of the virus uh, compelled us to think about and and in in different ways to feel for better and for worse because obviously in in certain respects it's a nightmarish thing and then in other respects, it's not at all. It's it's like uh, I'm I'm sure that I'm not alone. Tim and I are not alone in in the feeling that, especially in the early weeks, um, there was a sense that um, this massive these massive changes that are now happening are the kinds of changes that have to happen in order for better things to come about. Um, yeah. And then, and then Black Lives Matter happened, you know, and um, we're talking about planet scale things here. Black Lives Matter is a planet scale, human being, collective awareness showing up just in time, actually, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I personally believe that if we're actually going to get to a more ecologically just future for all the life forms in the biosphere, destroying white supremacy and patriarchy are like item number one on the agenda actually for those logically prior to even doing anything about that. Um, other life forms, yeah. Um, and you know, when there's a slight scale shift or a perspective shift, right? When you're not going to the supermarket because you don't want to get people sick, but you're aware that there is a supermarket and there are people working in that supermarket around the corner. Um, and you're sort of slightly suspended in time in your house there, suddenly you start to see how the normal way of experiencing time is really just counting off of a sort of habitual measuring device, right? And it's not really sort of time-ness. So that's the sort of theory of it, right? Like ecological awareness, it just kind of means realizing that things are happening on lots of different scales at once. But literally, actually, for, for me, Everything happened last year. You know, 2020 is a good name because my dad died, my lizard died, I got properly divorced. What else happened? I got really, really sick. Um, so many things, I, I figured out, thanks to a very helpful person, I was a non-binary non gender. And all the different types of grief that you go through when 
lovely and horrible things happen in your life, right? And, 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 and grief itself, like the unconscious, is this kind of... Time, timeless is a way to describe it, right? It's sort of like... Um, I like to think that it's like... Because um, I figured out how to do it, luckily, last year, because I got so much of it going on. Um, it's sort of like a... It's, 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 it's sort of like a body worker, you know? And it's sort of like the size of your life, so you can't sort of get around it or above it. And um, my, my name for mine is Barbara Hepworth. It's like a giant kind of spiky looking, massive life scale, tin scale thing inside of me. And it's sort of like a body worker, you know, it's sort of like my pa pa past trying to give my future a massage. That's what I think grief is. And it's sort of saying, listen, this is gonna sound really odd, but just lie down in the bed in the fetal position and you're gonna feel like you wanna throw up you know, and it's gonna be really, very strange, but I'll leave you after a while and then I'll come back and visit you again. And after it had happened a few times, I was like, wow, my abs really hurt. You know, and I've, I phoned up my friend who's a grief counselor in um, Los Angeles and he said, drink lots of water. I thought, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit like having a massage, you know. Um, and, um, you know, given that we, on the one hand, this is sort of huge perspective shift. On the other hand, it's caused by something quite slight. You know, and I sort of like how it's it, 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 it's not a ma it's, it, it's not like we really went on a general strike. We just sort of hunkered down a bit and, and kind of stopped. And just the relative slowdown in, say, for example, traffic on the street outside was huge. Like suddenly to get a sense of just ever so slightly less of the Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice brooms of the world kind of churning, 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 less of that kind of mechanistic kind of death drive repetition of the past stuff and to get a feeling of oh that another world is possible especially you know living in the context of an what i take to be an actual fascist you know everyone seems to be well many people still seem to be waiting for sort of emperor palpatine to show up nick with like a posh english accent and sort of actually take over you know but that's actually not what's really happening it's like obviously a sort of um criminal moron kind of in the in the shape of Parsifal showed up to be the in charge of the USA and um that was actual fascism which I also take to be the past you know sort of eating the future um and um so it's been a very strange um and powerful kind of sensation on a number of different levels of like the the past and the future kind of sliding over each other in a kind of relative motion, like you're walking the wrong way down a travelator or up an escalator that's going down or whatever that is, you know. Yeah, there's one, um, there's one thing that I suppose I think about here, which is the, the anger, the question of anger and, and which, is, which is related to the grief. And um, I suppose for me, you know, maybe, Tim and I haven't particularly talked about this, but the this, the, the question of um, how one registers rage, you know, how one how one um, talks about uh, one's uh, absolute rage and fury with uh, many things that that have been happening, and there's there's a, a point where. Uh, I think Tim refers to, uh, uh, I'm not sure where this quote comes from, but it's, it's Proust. And um, it's a reference to uh, the remorseless gentleness with which Proust puts established attitudes out of business. Um, and I, I found that a kind of inspiring remark, um, an inspiring way uh, of of, of thinking about um, the project, of thinking about life, thinking about um, what we're doing, and uh, for me, it's it's been one of the one of the registers of the writing, um, uh, which has been you know I've 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 loved in in what you know you've you've written. Um, so. Mm. Yeah, it's actually um, the uh, Theodore Adorno uh, talking about about Proust and how yeah, that's right. He, yeah, he, he demolishes the aristocracy with remorseless gentleness, and it's like, how do you really disarm a a 
bomb, right? Sort of ideological, physical, whatever it is, kind of bomb. Um, you need you want to do it relentlessly, but very thoroughly, you know. And this this kind of contrast that people draw between kind of yin style, contemplative style, oh, you're just kind of doing contemplative kind of airy fairy things versus real actual yang kind of revolution masculinity stuff. Actually, you know, maybe those two things aren't quite as different as you, we like to think. And maybe part of the part of the work is actually um, really, really thoroughly kind of dismantling something through this through this gentleness, which I think to you know it makes me think about writing a sentence. You know, um, the, it, sentences are gentle in a way because they're not they're not like made of knives, but they but they're very remorseless and kind of um, in a, in another way. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to also ask you a little bit about um, spatiality. So Nick, you talk about these, um, you bring up these two terms, telemechanics and teleperformative. And so I was wondering if you can kind of expand, expand a little bit on that and what you, what you might mean by giving that latter term um, a certain dignity um and just both of you can you reflect a little bit on on how the pandemic has has enacted altered experiences or conceptions of of spatiality of distance and intimacy pardon me yeah i don't yeah i mean i don't know um whether uh teleperformative is is a word that um, is coined in the text and is is left. You know, it's one of the moments of of a kind of suspension. Um, though I would um, dare to hope that it does, uh, in some ways, gloss the some some of the kind of um, uh, experiences, not just that I've had in relation to working on this project with Tim, but this everything that's happening, you know, everything that's happening does, might, might, might uh, be, be thought about in, in, in terms of this figure of the teleperformative. Um, and, and this is not, I'm, I'm not thinking about this so much as uh, the power of Zoom, but, um, more like what we talk about as future feel or, or um, promise feel or, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, uh, ideas that Tim was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, I should say that, you know, like I suspect uh, many others, uh, I hope many others, the pandemic for me uh, was an extraordinary uh, uh, I was propelled into uh, spaces that I hadn't been in before. So, you know, I've spent 21 years living in Sussex, in the Downs, traveling to my university uh, through the Downs, looking at the Downs out of my window, um, walking up Seaford Head, uh, which is sort of kind of part of the Downs, but not going into the downs. And one of, one of the things that I found myself and, and still doing is, is walking in the downs. And it, it's, it's a completely different sense of space that I had. And I think that, that that's, that's certainly something that's fed into my, my writing um, in the last year. The, the, um, the funny thing about Zoom is that uh, if there is of need a funny thing about Zoom at all, um, the funny thing about it is that, in a way, I mean, as 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 uh, horribly symmetrical and grid-like the 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 the, the device is, um, it's also a promise that we don't want to hurt each other, right? Like when we when I've been teaching all my classes on Zoom, I've done all my lectures on Zoom, I haven't done any flying, and it's just like part of it is to do with a feeling of having mercy on on people. Right, so when you're walking in the street and you've got the mask on, 
you're actually saying with this thing, you're saying, I, I have mercy on you, you know, and I'm not going to come too close to you so that you get sick, sick and die. So actually, funnily enough, tape measure distance. This is a beautiful question because it's like tape, pop, pop, uh, pop, pop, part of writing the book is that tape measure distance is not actual distance because it's actually kind of emotionally or to use a fancy word, phenomenologically intimacy, right? Um, and then there's the other side of it, which is that, you know, I'm looking at a little green dot right now. So it looks like I'm looking at you, whoever you are. Um, but in a funny way, when you're looking in someone's eyes, when are you ever not looking in a little green dot and wondering if there's something behind it? So there's this feeling of kind of di distant, but intimate at the same time, kind of overlap, you know, um, which is haunting and beautiful actually. And there's, there's quite a lot of me that doesn't want to stop wearing a mask. And there's an even bigger lot of me that doesn't want to do any flying anymore unless it's to see loved people. Um, and I'm just about to have a conversation with the uh, person who helps me to do my lectures and stuff to say, look, we're going to have to figure out a different way of doing this in the future because I know that as an individual, I don't do much to influence the global warming, but I need to model something as a responsible person here. Um, so actually, when I when I get off this uh, thing that we're doing, that's the next thing I'm going to be doing is is, is having that conversation. Yeah, and I suppose in in some ways that um, these things that are being revealed were always like that. It's just um, bringing a bit of a magnifying glass to it um I, I feel like there's nothing special that we need to know extra to get through the next decade of of working with the fossil fuel stuff just while, while we're on that topic uh, we've got everything we need inside of us we do, we've just been sort of alienated from some of it and in a funny way thank virus you know if, if i can't say thank god i could sort of say thank virus for for, for helping me for making me know that yeah, and kind of building off of that a little bit, and and perhaps the um, the distinction between um, what we know and what we feel, and and how these um, translate into action. So, I was really struck by your phrase, Tim. The the can you feel it? That is the primordial energy of language, um, and then you also have this notion of theory feel in the in what you read to us. Um, so how what are these notions of feeling that inform your writing and thinking and and what does that bring or what will that do that theory without without feel lacks okay so like part of what was and is incredible for me about black lives matter is that it's a phrase from the future right it's like wouldn't that be great if it was true you know um and um you know how uh, there's this idea that 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 um, the thinker Raymond Williams said called structure of feeling, and he doesn't go into it very much, but I think it's this. I think it's actually um, a a sort of shimmery, fragile sort of um, futural quality to to things that we don't quite have a solidified ideological structure for yet, and that's good, right? It's a little bit like how in Afrofuturist writing, it's like hyperspace is everywhere. You know, you just have to know where to look, how, how to get to it. You have to know how to sort of open the portal. But really, it's behind the screen and it's under my shirt and it's sort of it's like everywhere. The future is everywhere. It's not a dot on a Wikipedia line. It's actually intersecting with whatever this is now, now, now which is maybe more of a fake concept, actually. Um, and um, then, you know, I've, I've been reading about the, the ritual and language and the sort of uh, going theory in Harvard in religion and the origins of languages that it started off um, because, you know, in groups of over 150, grooming is no longer socially effective as a means of bonding for people like us in groups of over 150. So, you know, some primates ate some funny leaves and they got really high and they started a ra raving and they did the thing that you do when you're doing that, immortalized by Mr. Fingers, 
1987 or 8, I think, in the song Can You Feel It? Um, Detroit techno thing with Martin Luther King talking over the top, you know, namely, can you feel it? It's that feel, it's a feeling. Then I went to vote and no one spoke at the voting place, right? But there were hundreds and hundreds of people and we all were thinking the same thing. And it was incredibly obvious what we were all thinking, which was, we're going to stop this guy. We're going to stop this guy from having four more years. And you could, you could feel it. I'm getting goosebumps, like say, saying it, right? And it's part of language is the, is the meaningfulness and the meaningfulness is the future, right? Like when I teach the theory to my undergraduate students, I always say something cute, like, you never know how the sentence is going to end, elephant, banana, sausage, parenthesis, period, question mark, dot, 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 right? So the, the, the meaning's always off to the end, but it's not completely off. It's like overlap a little bit, right, with, with the squiggles, you know? And in the same way, the, fu the future must be kind of overlapping the pop with the past, right? Otherwise, nothing could happen. And... Um, I think what we might have seen in, in the last few months is that a genuinely different world is possible, you know? Um, and it's very, very important to sort of know that. Um, and um, la 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 like language and, and, and art and all that poetry is like a place where we let that be true, right? Like we know that the poems a result of a whole bunch of little micro decisions that were made by whoever or whatever that was. And, probably like lots of different things made those decisions, right? Like, let's put a rhyme here and let's put a metaphor there. And, but what does this poem actually mean? What is this actual, who is this Tim Morton person, you know, that they, they, they chose to put this orange thing on and they've got this funny head. All this is the past, right? But who is this guy? That's the future, yeah. And, you know, in the, in the very, very mechanized world that we've got, which is very much to do with automation, to the highest possible level of the kind of capitalist economic structure that we're in, it's very hard to know that there is an, another world is possible. And lots of forces in our world are trying to make it that, so that another world isn't possible, right? The most extreme of which would be the fascism, you know, which is trying to look for the meaning in the wrong place. It's trying to look for the meaning in the little bits of the past. And literally in a funny way, the fascism and the previous president are in fact a coronavirus, right? It's like the virus of being the king. If you look at old cartoons of, of, of George III by Gilray, he's exactly the same as the current president because that idea is somehow embedded in the, in, the, in the America DNA because of the slavery, right? And it's like that we some, somehow there's a way in which um, it's terribly important to know right now that it's very sort of stark, you know, in all kinds of different ways to do with, with ecology and, and, and race and gender, that another world is possible. Um, and, you know, that, that's sort of what gets you out of bed to write the next sentence of, of, this, of this thing that I'm doing with Nick, I, I feel. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I mean, I completely um, go along with that. And, and I guess just add, you know, how much poems and music have been a part of this this thing that that you've just been talking about you know this this sense of you know at a time when you know our discipline so-called english is um, really kind of you know seems to me under pressure of being you know dismantled um this is what we need this is this is the, the these this is what what it's about it's about the other possibilities and and uh what we've been referring to as future feel so you know it, the, the 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 feel quality I, I i used to hate that phrase the fit the feels i first read it on facebook i said like, this is too sort of sensibility age for me but actually you know it's a little bit like everything comes with a certain feel, right? Like there's a way of handling a hammer, right? There's a way of making the drugs so that you get properly high. There's a way of holding the tennis racket. There's a way of, right? And it's the same with ideas, right? That everything has a, has a feel to it. Nothing's just like floating around in the void, right? And so, so there, is, there is future feel and there is theory feel. And it's taken me forever to get over the kind of 
theory class gaslighting that I had in Oxford in the late 80s um, to sort of realize that actually the thing called l l life that literature was supposed to be about, like I was saying in the extract that I was reading, actually is the is the feel of the theory. Like what, I, I, you know, I'm not quite sh sh sure yet, a sort of feeling of like unsureness um, that's very kind of iridescent and compelling. Um, some, somehow those two things are the same, are the same thing actually. Um, so we are coming to the end of the hour, but um, I'll try and get one more question in. So um, this thing called life that you just mentioned, Tim, and you also, you describe your cat looking at your lizard and wondering, is that rock alive or not? Um, and it seems to me that this uncertainty as to what is alive is very apposite to our time, both in the context of the pandemic and of the climate crisis. Um, and so I wonder if just to, to close, if you can both reflect a little bit on how our perceptions and categories of aliveness might be troubled, troubled or transformed in this time. Yeah, that's a straightforward question, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, my answer to this would be, you know, you have to read Gemma Deer's book, Radical Animism and um, find out about the possibilities of, of thinking animism anew. Um, that's just a, a, a little uh, recommendation um, that I would make telegrammatically. Um, For me, um, alive doesn't mean living rather than dead, right? For me, life as opposed to being dead is survival mode. And I know all about survival mode. And it's quite true to say of me that I've only just figured out what, uh, what alive could mean above and beyond su surviving no matter what, right? So, so survive and damn the torpedoes, you know, that survive and damn the torpedoes is burnout, right? Survive and damn the torpedoes is, I'd rather burn out than fade away, as Neil Young said. But then as John Lennon pointed out, I'd much rather fade away than, than burn out, right? That's the other kind of dying, right? The, the first kind of, of is, is the death drive, just this kind of constant churning. And we've had this for thousands of years. It's called civilization, and it's doing a very efficient job of destroying the biosphere right now. And then there's the other one called fading away, which is the coronavirus feeling, actually. Um, and it's always, it's sort of disturbing if you're used to kind of the just keep swimming, just keep swimming, kind of finding Nemo feeling of the death drive, this other kind of death, Death is disturbing, right? When, when all the stuff inside me becomes the same as all the stuff outside me, it's called Tim is dead, right? But alive, actually, it's like a kind of needle that's flickering in between these two different kinds of death. It's not the opposite of dying. It's more like a kind of unstable, flickery thing in between, yeah? Um, and um, to me, this is the kind of life that this, that this, that this project is... Is, is made out of actually in all kinds of ways. Um, and um, it's a very new sensation for me. So I feel pretty kind of ignorant and overwhelmed by it quite, quite a lot right now. And, and very, very glad that I kind of landed right now anyway, in a place where I can, I can, I can sort of acknowledge it and speak and speak for it. Yeah, I, th I think the, um... I, I entirely concur with that um, sense of things, and and one of the one of the um, pleasures of of this project has been, well, one could talk about that thing in terms of Deleuze. You know, you could take Deleuze that little text called A Life, for instance, or you could take the you know the recently published Derrida seminars, Life Death, and um, they're also what we're talking about, but the way in which uh, I've I've found surprise in in the writing and the reading has been that we actually talk about uh, a chameleon, or we talk about um, uh, a mole, or you know, it. I, I think um, non-human life has been a, a really kind of um, insistent 
part of the rhythm to come back to that um that word um, a rith the rhythm of the of the work you yeah. know yeah and like how 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 do you truly kind of inoculate yourself against the against the against the fascism or against the coronavirus how 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 do you truly introduce yourself to little dead bits of it so that it can't hurt you and you can't make you hurt other people ever again. Um, and, um, you know, how, how, how do you deal with the fact that there are these little dead bits of code literally lying around, these little memes and tweets from hundreds and thousands of years ago, white supremacy and patriarchy being umbrella terms for a whole bunch of them. They're still around, you know, how, how, to, how to work with those things um, and um, make sure they don't hurt anybody ever again. Well, it is time to draw to a close. Um, and despite its perhaps uh, unwieldiness or uncategorizability, I'm sure that the text will find some kind of life um some kind of way in the world and we will all look forward to to receiving it to being that future audience um so and to the audience tonight um please join me in virtually thanking tim and nick for this discussion and sharing this work with us um and uh thank you indeed for joining and thank you both of you Nick and Tim for what has been a wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you. you. It's, a, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who's who's there. We don't know who's there, but thank you very much for for being here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>